Okay, we're so glad to have you all here today. It looks like we've got over 35 people joining and I'm sure more will, will come in as the minutes tick by. We're so great, grateful to have Dr. Dale Larson with us today. He's a professor of counseling psychology at Santa Clara University. And he wrote a wonderful book called The Helper's Journey which is about uh, professional caregiving and also family caregiving. And one of the social workers uh, who coordinates, facilitates our Parkinson's caregiver support group meeting, her name's Susan Weisberg, she highly recommended both a book to me some time ago and also inviting Dale Larson as a speaker. So we're so glad to have Dr. Dale Larson with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Robin. Um, I am just really thrilled to be here. I uh, want to thank Susan for her kind words and also uh, send some her way because she's a phenomenal helper and you're so lucky to have her uh, with you and supporting you. And Robin, you've done a great job pulling this together. And I am really honored to be part of this and very excited about today. Um, as Robin said, you know, I'm going to be addressing caregiving more generally, but with some very specific things directed toward um, Alzheimer's, uh, toward uh, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's caregiving, actually. And um, I, you know, want to say that, you know, I'll be talking about lots of different things that are, um, I think, going to be of interest, kind of the bright side of, of caregiving. There's some really very, very encouraging research. And we'll also look at the difficult side. So we don't want to trivialize the distress of this journey that you've embarked on, sometimes unexpectedly, that's happened in your life. Um, and I, I can't know all the situations you're in, um, but um, my heart goes out to you and, and to support. And I hope that some of the ideas I present today are helpful. I am not a, a Parkinson's expert. Um, I am a health psychology expert, counseling, things like that. Um, my, probably my major credential uh, is that I'm a long distance caregiver. And I wanna begin with that and share um, a little bit of my own caregiving journey because I think that maybe is a good way to start. The, the, this is my father on the left who had Parkinson's. So I lived through that um, with my family. And he died of aspiratory pneumonia in the hospital. And I remember that vividly. But you know, I remember sitting with him in the living room with my father, who had never allowed anybody to do any work on the house. He was just a terrifically uh, skilled man who could fix anything, a radio, a TV. <laughs> The plumbing, the electricity in the house would never have anyone else doing anything. And I remember sitting in the living room when he said, well, the men out in the kitchen who are working on things. And I, I was just shocked. First of all, he would never allow anyone to do that. But then I realized he was thinking they were there. And I think many of you have had that kind of experience, that kind of shocking experience. More recently, um, my, one of my best friends of all time from University of Chicago days. He was, Jay Van Sant was my roommate at the University of Chicago. He's given me permission to talk about his experience. And um, Jay uh, and I have for 50 years been very close friends and now he's negotiating Parkinson's and he is um, doing pretty well. He has, his wonderful wife, um, Barb, supporting him, who is a retired nurse. Um, and that has been really an amazing experience for me as a long distance caregiver. And I think the COVID situation I'm gonna talk about in a moment has made it more difficult, of course, because I can't just zip up there to see him. He lives outside Portland. But I wanted to share just, something from Jay's experience. He was head of quality at a local major tech firm and um, also a Zen Buddhist 
um, meditator, you know, volunteers cleaning the toilets at a Zen um, center in, in Portland, and a phenomenal person across the board who I love so deeply. And he said, you know, because he's in a, it's a point with it where he's hallucinating and he's having lots of experiences he can't drive any longer. But these are the words he shared with me. I said, Jay, what, what, what are your thoughts on this? He said, well, he said, you know, our obstacles are opportunities. He said, paying attention to what's going on in my body. You know, like, it's like when meditating, everything is slowed down. So he's appreciating that aspect of it. Um, and finally, he said, probably something we should all remember for every aspect of life. Your daily life is your training. So I am so eager to get up to see him. And I'm uh, really feeling that even more now talking to you all and getting really in touch with those feelings. So, you know, as I mentioned, um, you know, the COVID has really, pandemic has really created stresses and strains beyond our imaginations for all of us. Um, separating us from people we care for. Um, the, the, the COVID novel, COVID, the, the coronavirus has created a novel form of traumatic bereavement. So we're estimating a half a million to one million bereaved persons who will have a more complicated kind of trajectory in grief in their mourning. Half a million to one million plus another 5 million to 10 million who will have a different kind of grief because they haven't been able to be with their loved ones at the time of death. And, and it doesn't have to just be a COVID death. It could be uh, another death because the same kinds of things were happening in hospitals. So I'm hoping that, that none of you had to go through that or going through that, but that's a terrible um, effect of this coronavirus pandemic the social physical distancing, the self-quarantine, the isolation. You know, we study in psychology, the effects of loneliness and isolation and caregiving is in itself very often a very isolating experience. Uh, you know, it's a struggle to find time for respite. It's a struggle to, to be able to take that time. Now it gets even more difficult because we can't go out in public or we can't go to the places we would normally go. We can't get all the social support that we need. So um, I think that we've got to get the context that we're in right now in mind so we can understand our stress. Um, it can be a very, very lonely experience as all these kinds of end of, end of life experiences or, or serious illness or you know, caregiving situations uh, involve very often loneliness and, and feeling like geez, you know, I'm, I'm so alone in this experience and I'm gonna talk about maybe what we can do about that to make a difference there. Now, I don't wanna linger with the difficult side of things, but I just want to acknowledge it because otherwise you're gonna think I'm some uh, kind of Mr. Positive psychologist who's not paying any attention to the difficulties. I fully acknowledge and 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 really respect and, and think we have to recognize that this kind of caregiving is difficult. If we look at Parkinson's disease symptoms and caregiver quality of life, we see these kinds of things, the related symptoms, including difficulties with mobility, decreased emotional well-being, non-motor symptoms like loss of taste. These are the things that really affect quality of life and the caregiver experience. But what's interesting, and this is what I'm, finding, looking at the literature, and I, I report some of this in my book as well, the total hours of care are not significantly rated, related to reduced quality of life. And what these authors concluded, uh, Henry and Lagerman and others, it's possible that the provision of higher level of care, in other words, more hours, may provide meaning or purpose, and this is the theme I'm going to come back to over and over again, or a sense of connection for the caregiver. As a result, being a caregiver may be associated with more negative outcome, but for people who are caregivers providing a greater number of hours of care per week, it may not be. 
Now it's a paradox. I, I'm going to present some paradoxes to you that that helping can be healing for you. That that caregiving can enhance your more your your lifespan. I know that may sound counterintuitive, but let's look at some of the data and some of the the research on this because it is uplifting. At the same time, acknowledging that there is distress, we cannot you know dismiss that or not attend to that. We have to learn how to manage that but also to look at the other side of it, which is we're finding that caregiving can have some very positive effects. So to, to spend a few more minutes looking at the difficult side, we are very familiar, I'm sure, with the concept of burnout, which is that reduced personal accomplishment or demoralization. And this is gonna link up with what I'm gonna talk about in terms of enhancing our efficacy as caregivers. So the, the three hallmark characteristics of burnout are this reduced personal accomplishment. I feel like I can't do well at doing good. I'm not caregiving well enough. I'm not achieving my goals, my personal goals in a day-to-day -day situation in caregiving or in life generally. Even. And then diminish caring. So you're feeling like, geez, I'm just not having that positive feeling today. Not that you don't love your loved one, but you're just having a hard time pulling up those positive feelings and you start feeling kind of cynical about life and, and who's going to help us and you know why isn't the system working for me etc you get very disconnected and then you have to find a way to get reconnected a way to restore in some cases our empathy and our compassion uh, and this is you know happening as you've seen with covid care with nurses and, and doctors uh, in medical settings struggling to try to meet these demands. The, the, this burnout is a phenomenon beyond belief right now. And I've been working with many different teams around the, the world, actually, um, from Trinidad to wherever. It's so amazing. And we see it on TV every day, the nurse going, ah, you know, I can't imagine the overload that they have. And then the exhaustion that comes from that. So these are the three hallmark characteristics. And some of these are what we experience. And you know, we could look at the caregiver burden scale and say, well, which items are, you know, the the, the issues, this the, the things that are most stressful for me. And then we get our caregiver burden score and we go, yikes. Or we go, it's not so high. So, you know, we're always assessing, well, where am I at in this kind of burnout? kind of experience. Um, and, you know, to be burned out, even for a week, you might feel, I just am feeling like that. The good news about burnout is that you can be burned out for a week and then come back. And I, I would, I wish we were all in the same room. I'd say, how many of you are members of the formerly burned out club? And probably everybody would raise their hand and say, I was burned out for a month, you know, last year or, you know, earlier this year. Um, so it's kind of a badge of honor in a way, because you had to be on fire to burn out. So here's the point I want to make about burnout, which is all of Chris Maslach's research, who is the number one burnout researcher, and, and other studies of burnout suggest that it's not the bad apples. It's nothing about you that's causing burnout. It's the context we're in. It's the bad cave we're, cave we're in, which could be you know coping with serious illness in a family, um, dealing with situations like I was describing in, in COVID care, which are overwhelming. So if the nurse is blaming herself and saying, I'm just not stress hardy enough to deal with the situation. No, that's what we call the fundamental attribution error in psychology, which is a tendency to overly attribute to the individual and under attribute to the situation. So I just want you to get that fundamental concept. It's called a fundamental <laughs> attribution error that we tend to blame ourselves. We tend to blame the individual and not think about the context and understand that that's what's really ultimately most significantly predicting, as we say in research, the variance or predicting the outcome. So, okay, so there are difficult experiences. We know that, you know that, and we could spend our entire time talking about them. And I, I would, I, maybe we could bring some of those into Q&A and we could together try to, to address some of those things. But I wanna give you what I think might be most helpful right now. And these are the Chinese characters for Wei Ji, which is, means like Wei, crisis means danger and opportunity. And so there's a danger in burnout and, and the kind of experiences that we have when we're stressed to the max. 
But there's also an opportunity because if we can listen to ourselves and we can say, okay, uh, do some inner Googling, if you will. We are in Silicon Valley, at least I am right now. And I know Robin is and Susan. <laughs> so we're, we'll do some inner Googling and say, okay, ah, what am I, what's going on here? I need more balance. I need to take care of myself. I need to do something here so I can be fully present for my loved ones. So I can be healthy. So I can do what I need to do. And I think that's the important message from these inner experiences. Now, um, Dick Lazarus was one of my teachers at Berkeley. He's the, I think, the foremost stress theorist of the 20th century. And he had a transactional model that I want to give you some glimpses of in it. And I'm also going to be uh, referencing, because I am not the world's expert on Parkinson's, but you happen to have Dolores Gallagher Thompson, who is. And I'm going to draw upon her work a little bit. So thank you, Dolores. I've never met her, but I admire her work. And uh, also Al Albert Bandura, who I have met and who is thinking about self-efficacy has guided me. And there's a lot of new research looking at efficacy and Parkinson's caregiving that I'm going to bring in here. So what we're finding with self-efficacy, self-efficacy is it's important to, to know what we mean by self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is the belief in your ability to perform activities specific to caregiving. So it's like a sense of control. The, the interchangeable word synonym is confidence. Confidence. Am I confident I can do this? So when we look at, and I'm going to go over this measure of self-efficacy as a caregiver uh, with you. Self-efficacy mediated, and that's our fancy term for it, reduces or it modulates caregiver burden to improve psychological well-being. In other words, if you're highly self-efficacious in these situations, you, you have better outcomes. Um, the uh, social support mediated, and this is another finding, social support mediated the association just as, as self-efficacy did between caregiver grief and psychological well-being. So, you know, there is grief in this situation. It, we can have anticipatory mourning um, where we're having one small loss at a time, loss of some pieces of identity, the ability to do things. We know that so well um, in caregiving situations. Um, and social support for you mediates the association between whatever grief we're experiencing, especially if our loved one has passed, and psychological well-being. So self-efficacy and social support are two themes that have been explored in research, very beneficial for caregivers in different ways. Now, when we talk about self-efficacy, um, there is self-efficacy for obtaining respite. And I've already kind of alluded to that, that, you know, this uh, if we were meeting in person, it would give you an opportunity for some rest, but we could be meeting in a nice room at, at Stanford or something. But maybe just taking this, this short break during the day is a little bit of respite for you. I hope you're finding that. Um, the self-efficacy for respite, the kinds of items, and this is in one of Dolores Gallagher's uh, scales. Can you feel like you can ask a friend or member to stay with your loved one for a day when you need to see the doctor yourself? So you would answer this and, and say, how much do you really uh, uh, believe you can do that? How confident are you? Can you ask a friend to stay with your loved one? Can you ask a friend or family member to do errands for you? Can you, and you might say, well, I don't have a friend or a family member to do this. So there, there's the problem, Dale. You know, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not supported enough. Well, that can be something you have to really try to find a solution to, obviously. Um, but can you call a friend or family member to stay with them for a day when you feel you need a break? Okay, you get the idea here. How confident are you that you can obtain respite? This is important to work on. How about responding to disruptions? The examples that in this scale that are given is when, when your loved one forgets your, your daily routine and asks when lunch is right after you've eaten, um, can you answer him or her without raising your voice? Now, can, how do you feel like you can and are you confident you can deal with this if that's a situation you're negotiating? When you get angry because your loved one repeats the same question over and over, can you say things to yourself that calm you down? Now, I know some of you are not dealing with these 
very stressful kinds of situations. But if you are, and maybe they will happen sometime, um, I hope that, that not, but if you have that experience, um, how confident are you that you can negotiate it in a, in a way and, and respond to it in a way that's, that's helpful? And then controlling uh, upsetting thoughts about caregiving. Um, thinking about how confident are you thinking about unpleasant aspects of taking care of? Can you, can you control those thoughts? Thinking about how unfair it is that you have to put up with this situation. Thinking about uh, what a good life you had before the illness and how much you've lost. These are natural thoughts, but are you ruminating with them? And this is one of the things we know from psychology that rumination creates all kinds of problems, depression. And that's when you just go over and over things. So, you know, this is a scale that, that, that looks at um, how confident are you you can deal with some of the very common situations. And I think that if you're saying, I'm not confident at all that I can respond in ways that I can obtain respite and deal with disruptions, control my upsetting thoughts. Well, maybe you can do that a little bit more. Maybe just getting a little bit of control of those situations will feel very good. So this is, these are areas to focus on, obviously getting respite and, and not emotionally dysregulate, if you will. I'm sorry, I talk like a professor and I am one. So. But uh, responding to disruptions with emotion dysregulation, you know, where you become all worked up, your amygdala gets hijacked, we say, and you get very stressed immediately. Well, that's not good for you. It doesn't help in this situation. And then controlling upsetting thoughts, not ruminating about it. It's okay to reflect on things and say, wow, what, what is life bringing me? How am I dealing with this? Oh, I love her so much and I wanna be helpful. I'm not sure how I'm doing right now. That's okay. It's if when you start doing negative self-evaluation or you just kind of get lost in that, that's when it creates problems. I hope this is making sense. Maybe in the Q and A or uh, you can say, Dale, you were way off with that, but uh, this is what the, the researchers are looking at and what they're finding goes with better outcomes for us, for we caregivers. Um, now, um, you know, I mentioned Dale Bandura. This is when he came down to Santa Clara and I had him down a couple of times. Um, he signed a poster for me. He said, Dale, may the efficacy force be with you. So I want to just include that. It's kind of cute, but um, you know, I, we all need the efficacy force in our lives and especially in caregiving because we have to have that kind of confidence. I can deal with it, the little engine that could. And I know it may sound idealistic and, and dreamy, but it's true psychologically. If we can just muster that, you know, I asked him once, I said, what would you say to all these people I'm talking to who are helping people in very distressing situations? He said, Illegitimate non carborundum, which is, it's not actually Latin, but it kind of means don't let them wear you down. And, and, you know, he was kind of saying, sometimes you just have to reach within and find that strength. And I know you're all probably doing that every day. Um, but, you know, it was funny to, to ask the, the master, Albert Bandura, uh, what we need to do in those very difficult moments. So another thing that, you know, as that research was showing is we have to strengthen our social support. This was the conference that I chaired at uh, Santa Clara for many years, uh, Compassion in Action. This is one of my classes where, or no, this is a, a, an event, a family event. This, these are friends of mine. Here's Jay um, and his wife, Barbara, um, in Oregon. God, I love him. And, um, and this is, uh, us uh, in uh, with a, another group of our friends. Just something, maybe I put this slide in because I'm longing for these kinds of connections, you know, coming out of this crazy COVID period, hopefully coming out of it. Um, the, um, so the principle is if, if there's any finding in all of the social sciences that's confirmed more than any other, it's the beneficial effects of social support in terms of our health, coping, quality of life, uh, mortality, et cetera. So I'm gonna encourage you. I'm gonna push a little bit. I know you don't feel uncomfortable, okay? I can't reach you through the screen anymore. But 
phone, text, Facebook, Zoom, Skype, FaceTime, Instagram, whatever you do. Sit on your porch getting to know your neighbors if you can't, you know, uh, something people are doing in my neighborhood. Chatting from a safe distance, hopefully we can actually be close to people and without a mask, at least outside for now. Um, so get that help, get help. Uh, support groups and counseling at, like you're having at uh, Stanford with Susan and others, um, reach out to the, those, you know, because when you do that, you'll find that, oh my gosh, I'm not alone in this situation. And you get to talk about your experiences and, and you get that support that's invaluable to us. You know, it could be many different forms. It could be tangible kind of support, like could you help me and I can get some respite. It could be um, just purely emotional support, could be appreciations, you know, for what you're doing, an acknowledgement. There's so many ways that social support can take uh, different forms and be important to us. Now, one of the things we don't want to do, this is my little area in psychology. I have a scale, the self-concealment scale that's pretty widely used now. It's been translated into I don't know, 15 different languages. And it's used in a couple hundred major studies looking at this tendency to keep things that are distressing and slightly shameful to ourselves. Now that's a problem because it disrupts social support and reaching out. Um, and it has negative health consequences, depression, anxiety, physical symptoms, lowered social support. So then that feeds back to uh, worse health outcomes. Um, and um, you know the message that I, come away from all this research with is we need to have a confidant, we need to have someone we can express everything to, uh, to talk about the difficult feelings and to not keep them inside us, especially when they're troubling us and we feel some shame, like I shouldn't be feeling this, this is not acceptable. I'm angry at my loved one or I'm upset or I'm not liking myself because I'm not doing enough or all those kinds of things. You might say, well, you just gotta suck it up and you know, not tell anybody and just kind of suppress it, but that does not work. Um, and I'll tell you why it doesn't work in a moment. But I have studied helper secrets, which are interchangeable with caregiver secrets. In fact, a lot of them have been caregiver secrets. I mean, we're working with Parkinson's um, patients and with loved ones, et cetera. Um, and the themes that come out are, I'm feeling inadequate. I don't want to tell anybody. I'm, this is one way. I'm not getting anything back, which is not true ultimately, but we feel that in that moment. There are just too many demands. Who hasn't felt that at some point, especially if you're dealing with some more dire situations in your caregiving. The anger, anger is really not acceptable. This is my loved one, or this is my family, and I'm feeling angry. Um, my brother has not been helping out, or my, et cetera. And, and then we, we conceal that. We don't disclose it because we feel like I shouldn't be feeling this because we're so um, you know, concerned about how others will view us. And then emotional distancing, we're just finding ourselves kind of pulling back, but then we're feeling guilty for doing that. Um, now, here's a finding that's so amazing. Uh, Dan uh, Wegner at who was at Harvard, he died just a few years ago. But Dan um, did a series of studies uh, on the white bear effect. And what he did was he had subjects in his experiment um, uh, be told, don't think about a white bear. And so immediately, of course, they thought about a white bear. And then they would try to not think about a white bear. But the problem is when you try to suppress a thought, it comes back and then they would suppress it again and then it would come back and then suppress it again and it would come back. This is called the ironic rebound effect. And this is why keeping things inside in this little echo chamber that we're distressed about does not work because we never go anywhere with it. We never process the feeling, the thought, we never find meaning in it. We don't do anything that we need to do with it like reappraise. So James Gross said, um, uh, Stanford is doing some great work on emotion regulation. He's one of the foremost uh, emotion regulation theorists and researchers in the, in the world. And he's found that uh, reappraising things 
is much more beneficial than suppressing things. And it's very important to realize that. So we have to listen to ourselves. You know, Carl Rogers was a bit major influence in my life and my career, and I got to spend time with him and learn from him. And, you know, Carl said, we have to accept our experience if we're going to change. Uh, we have to be open to uh, our inner experience so it can guide us. And I think this is really true for us in caregiving as well. Uh, it's true for us in life. Uh, Goethe, I have a quotation in my office frame, as soon as we trust ourselves, we'll know how to live. So uh, the bear keeps coming back. Another principle for you know, enhancing our resilience, and the point I want to make about resilience is that it's not a trait. It, there can be somewhat of a trait component, but it's an outcome. So you're resilient if you have a positive outcome. There isn't a measure of resilience. You might think, oh, the stress hardiness, the sense of coherence, there are all these different measures. If, if you're a researcher or listening in, you might think, well, we can really assess this. Uh, even George Bonanno at, at Columbia, who I've done a lot with, he says, you know, you can't really assess resilience. But you look at the outcomes and then you see, well, they were resilient. So it's important to think about that. So what I'm trying to get around is you saying, I'm resilient or I'm not resilient. Um, that kind of way of thinking about things. Don't think about it that way. I, you can do things that enhance your resilience and your outcomes. And that's what we're focused on today. One of them is, you know, having balanced empathy. So what, as we're emotionally involved, and this is with our loved one who's suffering and with uh, other people in our lives that we're in our family and, and, and ultimately with ourselves, if you really reflect on it at a deeper level. We wanna have balanced emotional involvement. We don't wanna be over here extremely involved and just pulling out our hair and not able to sleep at night. And then we have a lot of personal distress, which derails our empathy and disrupts the empathy altruism connection. Because empathy plus a sense of loss leads to compassion and the desire to help. That can get um, disconnected in different ways. If we get overly stressed, or we're, and we end up over here with personal distress can do that. Here we're in the kind of burnout end of emotional involvement. So we wanna find a way to be here. And one of the ways that people have found kind of useful and it's kind of a, something that I've written about a lot and um, people find helpful, this idea of the helper's pit. So if the person you're helping is down in the pit, and I, you know, that, that sounds pejorative, but it's not at all. It's just people are in distress. If your loved one is struggling with Parkinson's symptoms and oh gosh, you know, they're in distress right now, or I can't find something or I, whatever it is, the distress is there, we're helping. And we're helping each other. You're in your support group and you're trying to help each other. You're listening to each other. What you wanna do is find a way to reach into the pit and help the person out of the pit without falling in the pit yourself. If you fall into the pit, then you're kind of useless to the person in the pit. You're equally distressed. You've got to find a way. And what do you hold on to? You hold on to your faith, your communication skills, all the resilience enhancing things you're doing, your, your, your physical health, psychological health, your social support, all the things I'm talking about, your sense of efficacy, all those things help you reach into the pit and then help the person out. So you don't wanna do this. And I know this is such a high tech PowerPoint. I have to show you again, because it's pretty impressive, isn't it? Yes, we are in Silicon Valley. <laughs> uh, I can't hear you laughing. I'm sure somebody's laughing at that because it is so silly. Huh? Um, so be mindful. Uh, have any of you heard of the concept of mindfulness? Okay, if you haven't, yes, it's everywhere. But we had John Kabat-Zinn come out to my university uh, several years ago, and Shauna Shapiro is one of the leading people in mindfulness uh, here right down the hall from me at the university. And this just means paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment, not judgmentally, but it's a certain stance toward our, I, I think, toward others and toward ourselves, which is one where we're present, where we're listening to ourselves. In Carl Rogers kinds of terms, we're listening to ourselves and the organismic valuing process is being accessed so we can learn from our emotions. We can process things. And you know every emotion has a particular need attached to it and every need has an action. So they can guide us 
in our caregiving and in our lives. And mindfulness really helps us stay balanced, back to that balanced position on the continuum of emotional involvement. And, you know, it, it's amazing that uh, it, this is, today I will live in the moment um, until uh, the, unless the moment is unpleasant, in which case I will eat a cookie. Um, Elizabeth Blackburn at UCSF told me we had lunch at the university. She did the re early research on film and she got a Nobel Prize for, for it, actually. That just meditating, meditation intervention actually improve the health of telomeres. These are, telomeres are the nucleoproteins that are on the tips of your chromosomes and they, what they prevent is what they call replicative senescence and basically aging. So if you've had adverse childhood experiences, you're more likely to have shortened telomeres. You don't wanna have shortened telomeres. So caregiving might be shortening, if it, the stressful components might be shortening your telomeres, but you can en enhance the health of your telomeres if you engage in some of these stress management resilience enhancing practices. So that's just so amazing. The, the, the telomeres are like aglets on your shoelaces, you know, that prevent the fraying at the ends. And the thing is when it, the, 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 when the chromosomes get frayed, then the whole replication process doesn't work very well and you start aging. And that's associated with all the diseases of aging. Someday we'll probably be able to go into Walgreens and for $75 get our telomeres measured. <clears throat> Um, so you had Kristen Neff speak in a series earlier, Robin, uh, showed me that, and I just think she's great. And, you know, she pioneered this idea of self-compassion. Here's a cartoon about it. We, congratulations, Mr. Medlin, we successfully removed your inner critic, which I was kind of alluding to with the helper secrets idea, you know, her self-compassion, uh, scale has these kinds of items in it, you know being kind to yourself when you're experiencing suffering. Um, see aspects of yourself you don't like, don't get down on yourself. So if you answer, I get down on myself, you're low on self-compassion. I try to see my feelings as part of the human condition. Uh, you know, uh, we're kind of all in the same boat. Of course, the existentialists say we're all in the same boat alone, but you know, in the COVID situation, what's really tragic about it is um, the way that there have been so many different experiences of it. Um, I feel so privileged to be working from home. I'm not a frontline caregiver. I, and, uh, you know, but the service people who have been exposed. So we're all in that, you know, it's a perfect storm, but we're in different boats in that storm, as someone said. Uh, when I fail at something that's important to me, I tend to feel alone in my failure. So you, you want to, you want to not um, feel alone. And that's where the support group with Susan and other experiences and talking to people and FaceTime and all those things can really make a difference. Uh, when I'm feeling down, I try to approach my feelings with curiosity and openness. This was Carl's central theme and Gene Genlin and other of my teachers back in the day. You know, be friendly to those inner experiences. I know this sounds hard and it sounds idealistic and I sound like some sort of a, you know, dreamer. But being friendly to our, our, our system is guiding us. You know, these emotions uh, have the wisdom of the ages. There's something that Dick Lazarus once said. We have to listen to ourselves if we're gonna find the way to act in a given situation and, and see, because emotions arise from a certain appraisal of things. When I fail at something important to me, I become consumed by feelings of inadequacy. You know, that's back to efficacy. So how can we move this in the direction of self-compassion? Love yourself, be kind to yourself, understand you're in a difficult situation, and you're doing something that's amazingly wonderful in your caregiving. You know, I want to just say something about this idea that, you know, we are wired to be caregivers. You know, the caregiving system is so powerful in us. Uh, it is amazingly powerful. We have altruistic brains. Um, these are, you know, mirror neurons that, that are underlie and, and, and drive our, our, our empathy for others. Um, this has been so well researched now. Um, and you are really exercising those mirror neurons a lot 
And I would venture to say that, that for, you know, we have slightly more robust mirror neurons in this group, um, really caring people who are putting themselves, you know, into situations where you're exercising, you're caregiving and you're caring. Um, and that's important. Um, the, the research is dramatic. You know, when we look at different species, we see, and I know you have to read chapter one of my book. I'm not trying to sell my book, but the chapter one in my book has a whole discussion of this, you know, the wellsprings of altruism. But when we look at, um, you know, what all the, the, the researchers studying animals are finding is the, the trunkless elephant who's fed by other elephants, the blind pelican fed by other social Darwinism does not really hold up. Um, the, the rats, rats are amazing in terms of the, the kinds of, I mean, call it empathy or altruism, you know, with other rats, especially if they've been cage mates. You know, like Shakespeare said, he just has scars and never felt the wound. And then the monkeys. I know you, you, we have images constantly of terrible things happening between animals and people. And, but when we see violence like mass shootings and things like that, which horrify us and are just ter just shock our view of you know, humankind, and we can pull back in that moment. Or we can see all the acts of helping that are happening, thousands of acts of helping that are happening immediately following and even during the act itself. I have a very positive view of human nature. We can get derailed along the way through conditioning. And if you track this back to the childhoods of people who do these things, it's, it's, it's understandable, it's not acceptable, but you can see how they eventually lost touch with humanity and how they became more psychopathic or disturbed along the way. Now, this is one of the studies that I really love, and I know you can't read it and it's impossible, but let me just read, this is an excerpt from Roth, and Haley, Bill Haley's a friend of my University of Southern Florida, who does, he's really a caregiving researcher. He's like foremost. I love him uh, for his work. Uh, they wrote, to be connected through care, and forgive me for reading this, but to be connected through caring relationships with other human beings, especially within one's own family, is a common human experience desired by virtually everyone. Providing care for an older family member or friend with a chronic illness or disability is an increasingly common and important type of caring relationship. I'm sure you have all the numbers you know, in your own mind of how many of us, all of us will either die or be a caregiver at some point. Um, and um, we will do, well, we're going to die, but we may be a caregiver before we die, you know what I'm saying. We assert the caregiving is stressful assumption is an overly narrow, simplified, and limited view on these types of human relationships. Multiple perspectives from research on altruism, volunteerism, and evolutionary perspectives on pro-social behavior are currently emerging to provide a broader and more balanced view on the range of caregiving experiences and health outcomes. So we find that mortality rates are, are reduced. We say family caregiving appears to be similar to other pro-social helping behaviors in that it provides stress buffering adaptations that ameliorate the impact of stress on major health outcomes, such as mortality. Cohen et al. say this, possessing a high sense of purpose in life is, and this is based on research, this isn't just them thinking this and you know, having a thought, high sense of purpose in life, Okay, get in touch with in yourself your purpose in life right now. What, what is it? You know, how is caregiving figuring into that? With a reduced risk for all cause mortality and cardiovascular events. Isn't that amazing? A strong correlation exists between, this is another study one by Post, the well being, happiness, health, and longevity of people who are emotionally and behaviorally compassionate. So long as they're not overwhelmed by helping tasks, you might say I'm overwhelmed by helping tasks. <laughs> so this doesn't apply. Well, we've got to get balanced and then this can apply. So, you know, these are just a tip of the iceberg looking at this, you know. We know that, um, you know, there've been some icons who helping icons or in our culture, who we kind of admire these figures uh, who have 
said things like this. Einstein, who said only a life lived for others is worthwhile. Only a life lived for others is a life worthwhile. And Mother Teresa, how many of us have not had a day where we said, this is not a Mother Teresa day. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not living up to Mother Teresa, you know, who was caring for the poor. And uh, I wasn't asking them what religion they were either. There's joy in transcending self to serve others. McClelland at Harvard did a study with uh, these kind of snooty Harvard undergrads, actually, because some of them said they didn't like Mother Teresa. But whether they like Mother Teresa or not, all of them, after watching a film of Mother Teresa caring for the poor, had enhanced immune function. They did immunological assays. Isn't that amazing? So you got to think about that. So just watching, caregiving, helping, altruism, uh, enhance their immune function, like at the cellular level. So this is like where we're starting to look at things. There's a uh, a new concept that's being researched, eudaimonia. I know it sounds crazy but to hear it, but it's a Greek word for a different kind of happiness. And it's not the happiness like, oh, geez, I've just had a great thing or, you know, blah, 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 which is good. You know, we want to have fun, good Netflix program. I'm sure we've all, you know, been watching good whatever programs that we enjoy, et cetera, that brings some pleasure. Eudaimonia is deeper. Deeper, it's, it connects to our sense of purpose, it sense meaning in life. And that's what caregiving really connects with. It's that sense of meaning. This has profound meaning. Also, you know, one of the thoughts I had uh, this morning is I was thinking, hey, you know, people are observing what you're doing as a caregiver. Your children, if they're, you have children or relatives or neighbors or whoever is seeing you, is getting an idea of how we should be with those we love. Um, so when they're in this situation, say a young person who sees this, um, and then their loved one has a health issue like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or you know, Louis body, they're gonna step up. So in a way we're changing the culture. You are changing it by virtue of what you're doing you're passing that torch along. Um, here's Schweitzer who said, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I know, the only ones among you who will be truly happy are those who will have sought and found how to serve. He's a pretty smart guy too. Also, uh, he said, if you lose your reverence for any part of life, you will have lost it for all of life. Yeah, here he is choking this one. It's a joke, I'm sorry. So, you know, <laughs> You have to think about what you're doing in the moment, the value of it, the value to your loved one, the value to your to yourself in terms of your own health. I know that maybe you haven't been thinking about it that way, but I'm making the argument today that it can be very significantly positive for you and your health. And I, I, I always begin my talks or began the book and my lectures or end with this quote from George Bernard Shaw. He wrote, this is the true joy in life, the being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, the being thoroughly worn out before you're thrown on the scrap heap, <laughs> the being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish little clot of ailments and grievances complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. I've been there. Life is no brief candle to me. It is sort of a splendid torch, which I've got hold of for a moment, and I want to make it turn, burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations. So you have hold of the torch right now, and you're making a huge difference, and I want to thank you for your caregiving uh, from the bottom of my heart, really, and as a fellow journey, journeyer. And um, I'm going to end now and open it up for discussion. I hope we have some. I hope we have some sharing of, of your experiences and what, if any of this makes any sense to you, uh, I would love to hear it. So thank you. thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Larson. We did indeed have a lot of questions and, and a lot of compliments already on the wonderful presentation and people, um, I've assured people by the chat that, that yes, that today's webinar is recorded and 
and um, my colleague extraordinaire Denise Dagan is taking notes and we'll we'll share both the notes and the webinar recording in the coming days. So uh, let me launch into some of the questions. We had a lot of them. Um, one of one person um, and you reflected on this in one of your early slides. One person says, I feel like such a failure as a caregiver. How can I overcome those, those feelings? It's so painful, isn't it? You know, um, <clears throat> I would think the first thing is to realize the context, like I was trying to argue, you know, we, we forget the situation we're in. Um, you know, I, this was something that I've heard from a lot of nurses working with COVID because, you know, it's an unpredictable kind of death and it's an illness that sometimes, or especially early on, they couldn't treat really at all. And they felt like failures. Physicians feel like failures when people die. I can't do anything. So caregivers feel like I can't somehow do everything. You know, you have to think um, a little bit of help is a lot of help. And you also have to think, I can do what I can do, uh, practice the art of the possible. And I know that sounds like not enough, but life is complicated and there are limitations to what we can do. And we can't prevent all suffering. We can't prevent sometimes th these tragedies that are happening in our midst. And, but we can make a difference in the way that we can. We, I think it's also important to realize that, that the to ask yourself constantly um is this a helpful thought or is it not helpful so when you're having that thought i'm a failure i'm not doing well is it helpful and you say that's not really helpful that's not going to help me i just feel worse well then try to not think that thought i know that sounds uh contradictory because i was saying if you try not to think about something you're going to think about it but try to try to say ah, I have a different way of thinking about this. I'm doing the best I can and I'm making a difference in a small way today, but I made some difference. Um, and, you know, to those of us outside, to Robin and I and Susan and whoever is outside or other caregivers, we would go, yes, so good. You know, you did that. Dang, I, wow, I don't know if I could have done that. Or I, oh boy, you really put yourself out. And yet, you know, you feel like you didn't do enough. Also, I'm sorry, folks, we're a little bit perfectionistic. And uh, Robin's nodding her head. I'm sure she does have a little bit of that. And uh, Susan and I and all of you, you know, we, we're all a little perfectionistic. And then that causes problems because there's perfectionism that's okay. And there's maladaptive perfectionism. I sound like an academic again, but I am. And, and that causes problems. So we've got to watch out for perfectionism. We've got to watch out for blaming, self-blame. And we've got to also talk about that feeling of, I feel like I'm a failure. If you're in a support group, say, I feel like I'm failing. And somebody will say, hey, me too. We're all failing because we can't do everything that we would like the universe to have happening right here, but we can't do it all. Um, you know, you can't read, I want to stop my, my friend's Parkinson's progression. Every time I talk to him, I'm kind of nervous that something will have changed in a way, you know, and, uh, how attentive is he being when we're FaceTiming all the time? You know, how, is he, is he hearing me? I'm, we, he had, he had to get a hearing aid. I'm just going into my own caregiving experience. This is interesting, isn't it? That I got into my own feelings. Uh, and, uh, and I, so I'm, I'm going, uh, you know, is it, and then I realized he, he needed a hearing aid because he wasn't hearing me. And I thought he was just, and as soon as he got the hearing aid, we're back in conversation. And um, um, so, you know, I was so worried that he was really getting, you know, kind of lost in, in his experience. So anyhow, and then I felt like I'm, I need to go there and, you know, right away and all that kind of feeling. Yeah. Okay, let's hear the other ones. I, I go on okay. too long. Um, we got another question. I I liked your little cartoon about the the pit and the the the, the helpers, helpers prayers, yeah. Pit. <laughs> and we got a question, which is, how do you know when you're at the edge of that pit, when you need to jump down into the pit? You don't want to jump down into the pit, but you can fall into the pit, and that's when you're distressed, when you're out of balance, when you're having your own emotional reactions, you know, kind of take over. 
Um, and you know you're in the pit. Here's a, here's a good distinction. Um, uh, you know, the difference between sobbing and, and having a tear in your eye. Okay, you're going to have situations where you feel sad. Sadness is not bad. Having a tear in your eye when you encounter a new loss or something in, in this experience is fine. But if you start sobbing, you've then lost your connection as, as a caregiver. Now you're in the pit also. Now, it's okay if you're going to go off and sob with someone else and be with them and share your feelings like it's so terrible and I'm, I'm feeling terrible. That's okay. But in terms of the caregiving world, right in that moment, I think we all know this, we have to find a way to not go into sobbing because then the focus shifts to us and then that's not helping in the situation and we fall into the helper's pit so you and you're on the edge when you're feeling like some of these disquieting feelings of like I, oh, I feel, I'm feeling like a failure I feel I'm so exhausted I don't know what to do I'm not asking for help I don't know how I can manage these feelings that's those are signals from inside so you go oh okay, I'm feeling that now. Instead of going like, ah, try to be open to it and go like, well, what should I do about this? I have to do something about this. I have to take care of myself. And then you have to allow yourself to do that. So are you going to give yourself permission to take care of yourself? Well, I can't because I have to be the caregiver. I can't possibly, that would be so selfish. I'm sorry. It's okay to be focused on yourself. You know, it's important. You have to take care of yourself. Otherwise, you don't bring anything to this situation. That's that's my view. Now, that may be kind of, you know, um, I don't know how people hear that, but I think it's important. And, and I, I certainly say that to therapists. I say you can only be present, you know, if you're if you're um, not distressed and non anxious presence, etc. You know. Yeah, uh, there's another question that um, touches a little bit on this, the pit concept. And that is, at what point does anger at the care recipient become so troubling that the caregiver needs to pursue professional help? Well, I think it's, I think it, it's inevitable. I, I mean, uh, from my looking at thousands of helper secrets, Anger is, I mean, anger at also, in, I'm thinking about hospice and oncology primarily. So anger at family members who are treating their loved ones terribly, et cetera, et cetera. But in a caregiving situation, it's natural when your freedom is constrained, when, when your loved one with, the, with, you know, Parkinson's sometimes, you know, and again, I'm not the world's expert on this, but I, I know something from being around it and being with caregivers that it can be very frustrating, extremely frustrating. And you can have momentary anger, like why are you, because the personality changes and the demands are so great. Um, it's natural to have these feelings, but the question is, what am I gonna do with them? You know, can I say, oh, okay, here's where I'm really getting angry. I've got to take this and do something with it because obviously your loved one's not going to be, you're not generally, you're not going to be able to work this through like you would with your spouse if your spouse was healthy, right? Where you'd say, if, if Robin and I were in a relationship, I'd say, well, we're having this issue, let's talk about it, you know, and, and we would process it and hopefully get to a solution. Um, my wife and I try to do that as much as possible, you know, just process things and say thank you when you get feedback that things are difficult and, and then it works nicely. You're not going to have that kind of an interchange. So you've got to get that support from others, I believe. And, you know, one of the things is just writing about it is, is helpful. The writing cure, Jamie Pennebaker, whose work was largely, you know, got me into self-concealment because he was studying you know, how uh, he and I have done a couple of things together where, you know, they discovered just talking about um, things that are troubling that you haven't talked about into a, a microphone or writing about it, the writing cure for 15 minutes over four times, you know, 15 minutes a day for four days leads to all kinds of positive changes. So try a little diary and, you know, document this period, you know, it'll be great to, to help you understand. You've got to make some meaning, you know, when you have an aroused emotion, the key thing is to make some meaning from it. That's what an insight is, right? And that's a, a core change process, at least in therapy. I start going over into therapy, but you know, you, you, a 
making sense of an aroused emotion is a core change process. So and when it's happening, it's like, listen to that anger. What's that anger telling you? I'm feeling threatened or I'm feeling constrained or I'm feeling unappreciated or I'm feeling like the universe is not fair. It's not really my loved one, it's whoever. And, you know, might be anger at God, might be anger at, um, you know, uh, our social system, which doesn't provide enough support for caregivers, which is something Bill Haley is really working on. I think we need a national program for uh, supporting caregivers. And um, that's, that's the context, you know, and that's one of the reasons so many of, I'll say us or you, because I'm just a long distance caregiver, are really needing uh, so much more support because we don't have it provided in our society. Mm. So I'm, yeah, I'm, you know, I think it's a big issue. Yeah, uh, this leads to another question um, one of our attendees has raised is, what about the situation where you're not caring for a loved one, but you're caring for someone with whom you've had conflict your entire life or, or recent conflict? How can you, can you be a good caregiver with the absence of love? Mm. I just have a title for a, a new article that that person should write if they're an academic. <laughs> complicated caregiving, because <laughs> we have complicated mourning. When, when you have a complicated relationship, mourning is more complicated because uh, you have you know, mixed feelings. Uh, sometimes you have relief. Sometimes you have you know, uh, great distress. So how do you care for someone? How do you bring that, that altruism to the fore? How do you activate compassion when there's another part of you that's, that's, that's not including the other in your weeness, if you will? You know, it's like we have to relate to the person as part of our weeness as, you know, that's why it's so much easier with family members we're so connected to. But ultimately, you know, we have to, as, as professional helpers, we have to expand our sense of weakness to include all, all people of all types, religions, political backgrounds. We're not asking, you know, any of questions about anything. So it is hard and it takes more monitoring. It may be a limiting factor in terms of what, what it means is that you have to really, I think what I'm just imagining it's, it takes, it's more of a spiritual, this is me just preforming on this. I think it's a little bit more of a spiritual challenge. I think it's like, can I, can I help someone? You know, I had a client um, who uh, had been stabbed 17 times and uh, he, you know, came to me and he was traumatized when he got out of the hospital and he showed me the cut, cuts and everything. And so he had, he had some incredible things happen, and and uh, like, should I take one minute and share this? Is this a, sure, please. So, yeah. so anyhow, he had, he had, the first three weeks he's with me, um, he had, uh, his brother was killed in a head-on collision in the east, and he was a very spiritual man, very religious, Catholic guy, and he said, well, God stepped in and really. Um, you know, kept him from suffering, so he didn't die a long, painful death. Later on in the therapy, his half his house was washed away. He lived up in the hills here, and half his house was gone. He showed me the photos, like gone. He said, "Well, God saved the other half." Also, when he was stabbed, a police officer had appeared in front of his um, travel bureau, where uh, the guy had come back who had stabbed him. He had told him not to get a, a, a ticket that he was going to try to return three times. He came in, he bought it, and then he came back the next day and said, I want a refund. The guy, my client said no, and he stabbed him. Anyhow, I'm not giving you this story very coherently, but you get the idea. And his view was, this is the saving grace of, of faith, because he said the, the God sent the policeman. And I'm going, part of me, Dale of less faith, is thinking, I don't want this God on my team. I want to have the house, the brother, you know, and, and not get stamped. But, you know, that's, I'm just confessing. But the point it was, <laughs> I was leading up to, was he said, on certain days, as, as, as 
you know, a victim, I don't want to help them. But as a human being, as someone part of this bigger world, and it, him as a human being, uh, these, not him, but these people who are like him of his group, I'm not going to say what it was, I want to help them. So he was like, hey, these same conflicted feelings. I don't know if that's useful. I think it's a struggle. I think there are a lot of struggles. Who has an uncomplicated relationship? Let's let's look at that. I mean, I, I think that may exist in fairy tales, but most of us have some difficulties in our relationships and they can come to the fore in these situations. All the fault lines get exposed just, you know, when when you have high stress. So yeah, you've got to just be good to yourself, get support, talk about it, and understand this is um you know, this is uh, not, nothing is wrong with you for having this experience. Yeah, uh, one of our attendees notes that uh, about the topic of self concealment, that this is one of the benefits of a caregiver only support group is uh, in the context that the support group is confidential, everything's said in the room stays in the room, mm -hmm. and that uh, caregivers can be very honest with each other and say yes I'm very angry I'm, I'm uh, you know I, I blow my top etc it's valuable it's the instant empathy that only other people who are experiencing and you know professionals who have not experienced it exactly we can try we can be empathic but you really can get that instant empathy from people who are experiencing it. And that's how I, I started studying helpless seekers because I was leading support groups for oncology people, nurses and hospice people. And I said, everybody's saying the same thing in these different groups, but it's all for them, it's all secrets. It's like things that they, they don't feel comfortable sharing. I'm going like, this is, comes with the territory. I mean, there are a bunch of normal people who are all sharing, you're not gonna believe it, but I had this experience. I was angry at my patient. She spit at me and I spit in her face. And feels horrible. And then somebody else says, well, when they kicked me, you know, the guy, when he reached up and sexually grabbed me, you know, going to the room, I was so angry. I feel terrible. Well, you know, these are like natural experiences. Um, yeah. and, yeah. and, you know, but sharing, sharing in a group like that, I'm so glad. I really encourage you all to seek that kind of help if you, you know, and it's just, especially during this time of when we've had all this social isolation and everything, it's so important, you know, and Robin, I want to thank you for your good works there and Susan, you know, for for helping with the, the support the uh, caregiver community. I think it's just fabulous. Yeah, um, I know in the helper's journey, you talk a lot about guilt as the as a very common emotion that's felt by by many caregivers. And we had a question about um, guilt that's associated with placing a family member in a care facility, particularly if it's a spouse. And we see that in our caregiver support groups all the time. Um, I, as an adult child, place my father with an atypical Parkinsonism into a care facility. And it's my um, perception that it's much easier to place a parent than it is to place a spouse. Um, could you speak a little bit about the guilt associated with that kind of a decision? Well, I think your point is really an excellent one about you know, maybe being a little easier with a parent. Um, with a spouse, you're losing your, your future, you know, with a parent, you're losing your past, you know, um, and, um, and you're losing your present with your, your spouse too. You're losing a lot. Um, and in either case, you're losing a lot. I think it is a really difficult decision. I know I've had some clients in my clinical work, you know, who have for years, Help, did I do the right thing? You know, that setting wasn't exactly right. Um, you know, that wasn't exactly perfect. And, you know, we call this counterfactual thinking as the academic term, kind of the what, what if, or what, you know, if only I had, or, and again, you can, you can think about that. And, and, you know, there's just no perfect solution. Your limits are stretched. You can't do any more this is a solution. I wish that it was a world where all these settings were absolutely terrific and we could unambivalently 
you know, feel like I've done a great thing. Uh, I know when my mother went into assisted living, it was such a great setting that she was actually, I, my joke is my father died and my mom went to heaven. Not that she didn't grieve my father, but suddenly she's playing pinochle with, you know, I came from that kind of family, playing pinochle with women every day. I mean, what could be better than that? And then they're, they're making her meals and they're cleaning her, her apartment. And my sister lives right there. That was pretty good, you know, in uh, Chicago. But uh, I think it's a tough one. I, I think that, you know, this is the kind of thing we could talk about in a support group and get different experiences and what's worked and what's not worked. How can you ameliorate that a little bit? How can you make it a better experience for yourself? So you, maybe your guilt is less. I mean, guilt's not a bad feeling. Guilt is saying, uh, I need to do something here to kind of, you know, improve the situation. Um, it's better than shame. Shame is, you know, you're, you're beating yourself up and saying, I'm, I'm not good. Here you're saying, I don't know if I did the best thing. I don't know if there's a good thing, perfect thing to do in this situation. Um, even if you're a zillionaire, sil you know, Silicon Valley zillionaire, you still have misgivings about this or you have emotional issues. Why don't I have a big house where I can have the, my mother here and have somebody here taking care of her because we're not all zillionaires. <laughs> and I could be out there with her every day. And, you know, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I'm probably not making a lot of sense because I don't have enough experience with that. I haven't been leading Parkinson's caregiver groups, you know, like Susan has, I'm sure that, and Robin, it sounds like, you know, a heck of a lot more than I do about this from your work, you know, and your life experience too, but. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I think it just as you said, the, you know, the key thing is that how can you ameliorate the situation? You're not going to, you're not going to fix the situation. You, it's not fixable, but how can you, how can you do it such that you feel a little bit better about it? So, yeah. You've yeah. done the best you can practice the art of the possible That's and accept right. that, you know, one of the, the key things you know, Avery Weissman always said this, you know, to his, his trainees in, you know, oncology and that, and, um, you know, you're going to be in the same situation before long. So, you know, you don't have to feel tremendous amount of guilt in terms of um, life consequences. I mean, you want to do the best you can for your loved one, obviously. But the fact that we can't do everything well, you're going to be in that bed or you're going to be in that nursing home in the blink of an eye. And somebody's going to be feeling that way about you going there. <laughs> you know? And 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 this is life. This is just what we're dealing with here. And it's not perfect. And you know, uh, you know, Francis Bacon, I wanted to add this quote. I forgot about it today. He wrote in Tower of London, 1603, he said, to love is to give hostages to fortune, you know, and grief is love. Grief is love, you know, and and so you know, when when we accept this, this, this agreement that we're going to suffer when we love. And, and this comes with, with that territory. So there's no way to love without, you know, uh, having some of this, this sadness and these doubts and things, because you do love. And so you've got to appreciate that too, I think. Right. Um, uh, somebody's asked or made the point that it, um, my mother has a great life. She has Parkinson's disease, but a great life. She does what she wants. She watches TV all day. Um, she eats when she wants. She goes to bed when she wants. But I feel trapped as a caregiver. I'm exhausted and very envious of my mother's wonderful existence. What what can you say in that regard? Um. It, it's it's ironic, isn't it? Isn't it? I mean, it, I think the person is saying, "Isn't this remarkable?" I'm envying my mother with Parkinson's, and uh, yet I feel trapped. So back to respite. Back to what can I do for myself? Um, how can I? This is probably someone who's really setting this up so that it's going to be just really comfortable for the mother. And I, that's just so wonderful. But how can you also do more to take care of yourself? What are your limits? 
what are your pleasure limits? I know this sounds kind of funny, but do you have like pleasure limits? Like, oh, I, well, I couldn't do that because that would be, I, I wouldn't be doing enough here. Well, you know, um, you've got to stretch it a little bit. You've got to look for things you really want to do, find a way to do it. You know, a little bit of that will really make a difference and you'll feel a lot better and you won't feel so. See, when we feel um, our freedom is limited, this is Brehm's reactance theory. Whenever your freedom is limited, you get frustrated and angry. Mm -hmm. And so this is a, a high constraint situation. You've got to loosen the constraints somewhat, somehow. Um, you might, the person might say, I can't do that, it's impossible, but I'm just here. Well, um, maybe there are some ways, and that's the kind of thing in a support group you can get advice on. You know, like, what, what if, how do we do this? How do we get some respite? What do we do that's fun? What can we do together? Maybe somebody in the group, if you're in the support group, you can go to a movie together now. You could do something. Whatever is rewarding for you, you know? And I, I really want to say, I know that we're, people are, you know, several people have left now, but the people who are here, I want to say to you all, you are, your resilience is showing and showing up here and being here in this, this room, whether it's, I hope it's helpful, but you're, you're taking a step and you're saying, hey, I'm going to go get some more information and hopefully some support here. Um, and that's the kind of thing I think we need to do. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Um, somebody asked, is it my responsibility to keep my husband going and to ensure he thinks highly of himself? To keep my husband going, meaning, I'm not sure what that means. I think, uh, you know, get him up every day, making sure he's fed, making sure he has a schedule for the day, activities, um, and, and that he thinks highly of himself, that he's, um, that he, his dignity, perhaps, and self-confidence, self-worth is maintained. Mm -hmm. Is it my responsibility? I'm trying to reflect on that. Um, you know, the caregiver journey is something that we didn't sign up for. It's something that's come into our lives. It's like a career, un, un sought after career, really. It's a career, you know. And uh, in that sense, it's is it a responsibility or is it just a life circumstance? Um, what I hear more in that is this struggle, inner struggle uh, of like, uh, wow, it's all on me. And um, how, could I, how could I not have it just all be me? And again, that may be limited resources, limited support situation, you know? Um, and, and then a more complicated thing is, you know, uh, I, I've certainly seen this. Um, you know, with caregivers, with their loved ones, you see them when they're struggling, it's so painful. You want to encourage them and can make them help them feel better about themselves because um, I could see a little bit of that. You know, I, I've seen that with, with in caregiving situations for sure. I felt that trying to help my dad, um, you know, not feel terrible about <clears throat> the guys and the, he was imagining were out in the kitchen, you know. Um, so, um, I think it's a tough one. I think this is a kind of thing to process, um, and, and to seek more resources and to, to not take the responsibility in the form of blame. You know, I think responsibility, you know, is with an A, responsibility. You know, what's your... What's your responsibility? It might be limited. Maybe you can't with the A responsibility, you know, and 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 not to accent the responsibility, the burden, some aspect of it so much. Although it feels like that. If you're the only person, you know, I my you know, I, I often am so disappointed with my my male uh, sex, you know, with you know, not showing up in these situations. So I, I'm almost like wanting to ask her, you know, do you have a brother? Is he live from nearby? <laughs> I want to, I'm sorry. I'm just, you know, it's, it's, I, 
sometimes a family member's disappointment, I get upset with them. Uh, certainly in hospice and oncology, I've encountered this so much, you know, I, I want to I wanna say, hey, um, you know, it's a family thing, you know. Um, but anyhow, I'm not giving a very good answer because I don't have an easy answer at all, but I, I want you to, I want that person to, to um, you know, feel some self-compassion and also set some limits. I think setting limits, setting limits is hard without guilt. How do you set limits without guilt? Because sometimes setting limits is the boundaries are really the most helpful thing. And that's, that's hard to get sometimes. It's like, we said, I can't set any limits because if I set any limits, I'd be terrible. No, it actually is helpful. It's helpful even for the, your loved one. They might get frustrated. In the moment, why, why aren't you doing this? Because I can't, can't do it. Can't do it today, I have to do this. No, you have to, no, I can't. Can't do that today. And, and then they go, okay. And then, you know, I don't know. I'm yeah. just doing a little empty chair work with myself. Yeah, yeah. I think those are important reflections. Um, there are two if, uh, gripes, if you will, that come up a lot at Parkinson's caregiver support group meetings. And one is that the person is, uh, their care recipient is uh, just sit sitting around watching TV all day. And, uh, and that's very frustrating. And Another gripe that is can be related is that the person uh, with Parkinson's disease knows because they've been told by the community, they've been told by physicians that exercise is very important, yet the person doesn't engage in any exercise, whether they're fatigued or apathetic or mm -hmm. have some kind of an excuse. What, what can a caregiver do in the situation of persons not exercising or persons just watching TV all the time? <clears throat> um, well, motivational interviewing is not going to work in terms of exercise as much as I love motivational interviewing. Um, turning off the TV is probably not going to work because it would be... Um, a nuclear event. So how can you diversify their activities? Um, and again, it would be setting limits and saying, nope, you know, the doctor said we have to look at, I'm free forming on this. So you've got to, Robin, I think, you know, much, you have a much better answer than I do for this. But my first impulse is to the extent one can diversify, um, you know, a, a little, hobby kind of thing like work on this if the person's capable here's something to be interested in here's a little something here that's different you know what might be very healthy and then maybe something that includes a little bit of exercise um you know a little bit of uh if the person isn't wandering you know and you know is, is able to do some things a little bit more directiveness getting them into a hobby and say here's what we're going to do today um, you know, we're going to, we're going to do this and let's see if we can get this going. You know, they might, they might bond to that and like take off with it and then be doing something different and getting the exercise in. Uh, I want you to go for a walk with me, mom. We're going to walk around the block, you know, and again, I'm not, they're probably recognizing the limitations, you know, maybe can't go around the block with mom, but that would be my wife and I do that with each other and we're pretty healthy. We just say, let's go walk around the block right now just to, just to take a break from this computer stuff. <laughs> and uh, so I think that might be a, a direction, you know. I don't have, boy, you know what's interesting is, I, I, you know, I'm embarrassed. I don't have really great answers, but I'm also appreciating the, the challenges that everyone's facing. And that's, that's, that's okay. Yeah, I think, um, uh, you know, answers that we've seen in the caregiver support community are, you know, have the caregiver start the exercising and invite, as you said, invite the person to join, invite the person to take a walk. Hey, I'm going out for a walk. Would you like to join me? Hiring in uh, aides or fitness trainers mm -hmm. or people so that there's mm -hmm. somebody mm -hmm. else and often mm -hmm. people 
um, people with Parkinson's disease perform better when it's somebody else rather than the nagging spouse or the nagging yeah. daughter. Or we go up to the corner and get some an ice cream, you know. Yeah. I guess a related question, though, is to what extent, again, is that caregiver responsible for that person exercising or for that person not watching TV? And maybe it's back to that responsibility, responsibility mm -hmm. question. Um, because it so all devolves, no it all devolves on that one person. And that's right. what the person's saying is somehow all the responsibility for care has, has devolved on me because of my circumstance. My loved one is here with me and I'm the only person who is responsible. And that is situational. Um, and um, the question is, how can you manage this in a way that is not inimical to one's own health. And, and um, if it's filled with, you know, guilt and inner struggle, we've got to find a way to manage that differently. Because in this context, the situation is that you are the caregiver. There is, unless you can, re, re, you know, get some respite, or respite care, you are the sole person. And, and I think there's something deeper in this. It's like, how can I, how much am I responsible for stopping the, the, you know, the progression of, of Parkinson's? Because that's what's so painful. And, and how can we even begin to accept the increasing limitations, the changes in personality, the is increasing symptoms, which eventually happen. And that's, that's really, I think, uh, a responsibility you have to relieve yourself of. Yeah. Uh, you have yeah. to not feel like, um, if only I had done something differently, this wouldn't be happening. It, it's, a, it's a very difficult disease. And I'm just rooting for, you know, research where we can really stop this in its tracks, you know, early on and diagnose it early on. Um, yeah. And that's all we can that's hope. That's all we can hope for, you know. Um, yeah. That's so right. yeah. So maybe that's maybe that's good. Yeah. Okay. I think that's good. Uh, okay, we have three more questions and about three more minutes. So we'll I'll okay. try okay. to okay. Oh, sure. <laughs> all right. So um one person says uh Oftentimes in our local support group, the person with Parkinson's disease seems to be in a state of denial, whereas a care partner um, more appropriately sees the reality of the situation. And sometimes it's a, tr a struggle between these two things because mm -hmm. they have different perspectives, the care person mm -hmm. with PD and the caregiver. Do you have any thoughts about those two different perspectives and how to straddle that? Well, I would ideally have a mediator, you know, kind of be present who can say, hey, you guys have, you know, what's going on here? And um, the Parkinson's person would say, I, I don't think I'm really that, you know, I'm really, if they're in a state of, I guess they're saying it doesn't even believe that it's Parkinson's. Yeah, or just they seem to be kind of oblivious to it. Oblivious and, to it, like I'm not losing that much function. I'm, I could still drive that kind of thing. Whereas you're the caregiver and you're going like, no, you should not be driving, you know? Uh, and that's kind of fight that I've seen, you know, where yeah. who wants to have their driving taken away, et cetera. Um, yeah, and I think having a mediator, again, it would be nice to have these resources all over the place. Um, somebody who could help them talk it through. Again, it gets, you know, sometimes personality gets a little more rigidified and then you don't have the kind of inner emotional flexibility to kind of process things. And that gets, makes things not get worked through the way it would in a 
the relationship normally. So, and it's very scary to think about the Parkinson's person is really terrified. I mean, they're losing their life really. And uh, I don't want to accept that. And um, I don't want you to accept it. So it's nice to have the other person in denial. If you have cancer, for example, it's nice to have your partner going like, no, you're going to be fine. We're going to get through this. But yet you've got stage three, you know, something. And it's that's scary, very scary. Um, so, you know, the couple has to deal with it. I'm, you know, they're different relationships. You know, if it's your mother, if it's your, mother, your spouse, it's a little different. But yeah, the complex, but these are some incredibly complex situations. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, one person asks or says, one of the slides addressed mortality of the caregiver as not being adversely affected by the stress of the daily experience. How best to find that balance in the stress level to make that a reality? Yeah, it, well, one of the things that came out of the research, I mean, just in general, is that having that sense of efficacy, getting social support, and also, paradoxically, um, number of hours caregiving, that, I think you saw that, that finding, it was kind of, kind of surprising that actually that kind of mitigated the uh, effects in terms of mortality. Um, <clears throat> so you're gonna have stress in this situation, you know, but, and stress and also uh, growth, you know, with bereavement, we have post-traumatic growth. Well, with, I think with, with Parkinson's caregiver kind of personality growth can happen as a caregiver because, um, you know, we, 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 we really benefit from helping, um, we grow emotionally. We become all that we can become through helping others. Although it's much more stressful to do it with a loved one because we're dealing with this loss at the same time. And, um, and you're losing your support. The other thing we haven't talked about, if, if your spouse has, uh, or even your parent, if your parent's very supportive, you've just lost your key source of support. So who do you turn to? That, this is the person I would turn to. Now I can't turn to them. Now it's one way in the other direction. That's part of this picture. So makes it makes it really hard. So I would say work on some of the things that uh, I talked about today to uh, bring those helpful uh, stress mediate stress ameliorating effects into play. Yeah, I. Um... I think this is a good note to end on because I had never realized until I heard your presentation today, Dr. Larson, that um, that there are, with the whole Wei Ji Chinese concept of danger and opportunity, that there is a possibility of growth and um, and being better off in a sense by developing our altruistic side and that uh, that aspect of caregiving had never occurred to me. Mm -hmm. The only aspect of caregiving that had ever occurred to me was just how challenging and exhausting mm -hmm. it is. How challenging, mm -hmm. you know, just, mm -hmm. uh, how to manage the stress, but then yeah. how, to, yeah. how, to, how to recognize and nourish and support the growth that can happen at the same time. And that mm -hmm. the research actually shows that, that this caregiving, this extending oneself actually is good for us. Yeah, um, that's Although it's complicated. Yeah, thank you for bringing that research to light to us today. So uh, just as we couldn't, you could not hear people laughing earlier, though I was laughing and a few other people commented that <laughs> they were laughing. You cannot hear people clapping now and I'm sure they would be giving you a standing ovation if you could oh, hear you. everyone and see everyone. Well, I wanna give all them a standing ovation myself right now. So anyhow, I think I have my yoga pants on. My wife says, you know, Dale, why are you wearing yoga pants? You don't even do yoga, you know? But, you know, it's a funny thing, isn't it? I have dress pants, but I usually don't put them on anymore. Um, but well, you anyhow, look very professional from I, I do, yeah, I, I, I kind of pass, you know? Uh, but uh, anyhow, it's great, great to be with you all. So 
uh, and and definitely um, appreciations to everyone who's been here. So and thank you, so Dr. Much. Larson, for all your thank time and preparation. It's really remarkable to have a speaker prepare as well as you did on on this specific topic. So thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.